Hi, this is Ron Hipschman for Ice Stories, and today with me I have Ralph Harvey, who is uh, the lead researcher in ANSMET, which is, uh, what does that stand for? The Antarctic Search for Meteorites Program. The Antarctic Search for Meteorites Program. That's an amazing, you, so you come down here to Antarctica, all the way to the bottom of the world, looking for meteorites. They fl they fl you can find them all over the world, right? Yep, meteorites fall randomly all over the world. And uh, what's unique about Antarctica is not that meteorites somehow are attracted here or anything like that at all. Uh, there are two main reasons that places become good places to find meteorites. One is that there's a low background of earth material, whether that's due to low precipitation or, uh, you know, no organisms tilling the ground or what have you. So any place that's a desert is a good place. And particularly if the desert material is not something that would easily be confused with a meteorite. Mm -hmm. the meteorites that come to Earth have a blackened exterior crust. So if you've got a desert of white sand, that's a great place to look for meteorites. And indeed, deserts all over the world, North Africa, the southwest of the U.S., etc., meteorites can be found. Antarctica is a big white desert 3,000 miles across, so it meets that standard really well. And they're black on the outside because they've come screaming through the atmosphere? <clears throat> That's right. They hit the atmosphere at sort of 20 kilometers a second on average, and then they decelerate down till zero when they hit the ground. <laughs> and along the way, they get rid of a lot of that energy just by melting their outer uh, surface. Something on the order of bowling ball size ends up golf ball sized as a result. But back to the Antarctic question. Antarctica. And, uh, uh, the unique thing that happens in Antarctica is that meteorites that fall on the East Antarctic ice sheet end up sprinkled throughout that ice sheet like raisins in a pudding. And that pudding sags out towards the coast. And if it's diverted or slowed down by any mountains that are on, along the way, uh, that ice, that pudding, may uh, end up sitting and stagnating. And in that case, the loss mechanisms of Antarctica will take over. So you're saying that, that the ice that's up high is flowing down towards the ocean. That's right. The ice flows down toward the ocean. And in most cases, its cargo of meteorites is, is lost in icebergs, goes out to sea, and it's never seen again. But if the ice has to work its way through a mountain range like the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, some of that, that flow of icy traffic gets stopped, and the ice ends up in little cul-de-sacs or, or just slowed down enough so that the really dry... Uh, winds of Antarctica can evaporate away that ice so that the strong winds can uh, abrade away the snow and the ice. The meteorites, as a result, start piling up as a lag deposit. And if this goes on long enough, which it has with an ice sheet that's, uh, whose age is measured in millions of years, uh, you can end up with some phenomenal uh, lag deposits of meteorites. So you're saying that as the ice evaporates. As the ice disappears from the top, the meteorites are kind of left sitting left right lying there. there on the surface. Just waiting for you to come by and just pick them up. Just waiting for me personally. Personally? Yeah. That's really nice. When was the first meteorites found here? Well, the first meteorites were found in Antarctica right when people started exploring the continent. The very first one was the Adelie Land meteorite in 1912, found by a couple of people on Mawson's expedition. Um, and they didn't make a lot of it, though it was an extraordinary find. They were crossing a lot of ground, and uh, again, Antarctica is a desert, so you expect to stumble on things that have fallen from the sky. Um, when ex exploration of Antarctica really picked up uh, with uh, the first IGY in 19, late 1950s, early 60s, several more specimens were found here and there. And again, you expect that if you're exploring an area the size of a continent. Um, the first meteorite concentration was found in 1969 when some Japanese glaciologists were crossing a big area of blue ice near the Yamato Mountains. And they stumbled across nine pieces of meteorite. And uh, even then, they didn't make a lot of it. They figured it was just nine pieces of a bigger rock. But um, 
as they looked at them more carefully, they realized they represented at least five different kinds of meteorite. They couldn't have a common parentage. And in fact, some of the kinds that they had found were quite rare. And uh, my predecessor uh, in the Antarctic Meteorite Program of the U.S., Bill Cassidy, realized what the significance there was. Amongst that nine meteorites were a few pieces you would expect to only be a one in a thousand find. Mm -hmm. And he, he uh, his intuition told him there must be thousands more, and he was, he was right. The Japanese uh, were clued in on this as well, and they quickly found several hundred more specimens. And as of right now, uh, there are several nations that have conducted systematic searches for meteorites, and the total is somewhere around 45,000 specimens. That's a lot of specimens. That's, yeah, particularly given that if you went back to 19, the early 1970s when these programs got started, there were probably only about 2,000 specimens known from elsewhere. So it's a pretty phenomenal change, you know, a factor of 20 increase in the pieces of planetary stuff we have. I just study. want to go back to one thing you said. You said that they have discovered them on blue ice. Can right. you tell us what blue ice is? Sure. Um, the ice of the Antarctic ice sheet and any ice anywhere, frankly, if it gets deep enough, uh, the bubbles are pressed out of it. It recrystallizes in it. Instead of being uh, white and frothy, it becomes blue and very crystalline. And uh, because these loss processes have taken over in these meteorite stranding areas, uh, what is exposed really is that deep, old, blue glacial ice. It's, it's an artifact of, the, of these locations where loss mechanisms dominate over ice supply. And uh, uh, so we often call these areas uh, blue ice areas or meteorite stranding surfaces. The two seem to be linked together. There are certainly meteorites in other places uh, where uh, the, it's on snow or on white ice or what have you. But the concentration mechanism demands loss of ice, and as a result, they typically are found in these blue ice areas. Tell us a little bit about how you go out and actually explore for the meteorites. How does the expedition, how is it set up, and how do you do that? Okay, well, we, we, we go through a bunch of different phases. The first phase is really reconnaissance, where uh, we'll look carefully at maps of Antarctica, satellite images, et cetera, air photos, trying to find areas where this... Uh, traffic jam, if you will, of ice is taking place. And in those areas, we hope to see bodies of blue ice that are surrounded by rocks or the, or the flow is being retarded by submerged uh, mountaintops. Um, and those are the places we look at first. But the truth is, those kind of blue ice areas exist all across the Transantarctics. And with uh, the changes in the Earth's climate over the last 20,000 years, uh, there are blue ice areas that really haven't been there very long and therefore won't have any meteorites or very few. Mm -hmm. So we really need to get on the ground to look, and that's the next stage. Uh, when an ice field is visited the first time, it's usually by a very small group of uh, two or four people, each with a snowmobile, a very small camp. And at that stage, it's no more than an Easter egg hunt. They'll drive around and uh, follow their noses, follow their intuition, and, and see what they can find. Uh, when an area passes that test, you know, the, the, the reconnaissance group has seen that there really is a lot of potential for meteorites there based on the fact they found some. Mm -hmm. We'll send a larger team. And they'll, they'll do something that's much more systematic. They'll do a set of transects, basically form a line, six or eight abreast, and then go back and forth over the ice in an overlapping grid until everything... Every bit of ice has been looked at by some experienced human eyes. And uh, in those scenarios, we, we like to think we've picked up a very representative sample of what uh, is accumulating from space on the Earth's surface. And you keep track of their position with GPS so you know where you've been. You don't, yep. you don't every, repeat yourself. Right. Every specimen is, uh, we try and record all the information we can without it becoming too much of a burden just on collecting them at all and, and dealing with the Antarctic environment. We'll take pictures of them. Uh, we give them a little uh, temporary name tag, and uh, we measure them uh, in terms of their size, the amount of fusion crust they have. We try very hard not to touch them, uh, not to drip our drippy noses on them. We very quickly get them into Teflon bags and seal them up because these meteorites, uh, by virtue of having fallen onto the Earth's deep freeze, 
retain a lot of information. They're preserved very well uh, in ways that a meteorite found in North Africa or the Australian desert just can't retain. So uh, uh, we, we take a lot of care. And then those meteorites are, are uh, shipped, still frozen at the end of the season to uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas where uh, a little chip is taken off of them. We, we, we try to establish, uh, in the broadest terms, what kind of rock it might be, where it might be from, and uh, then they're made available to scientists all over the world to study. Um, and any scientist anywhere is, is uh, welcome to submit requests, and that info is all on You've really GSC. made these into public domain meteorites. It's a very altruistic system. And, uh, you know, if you compare it, no offense to my paleontologist friends or archaeologist friends, but if you compare it to the way those sciences typically work, where a scientist finds something and makes a career out of it, uh, this is very different. We find something and give it away for other people to make a career out of. And, in fact, it's, it's probably the reason uh, the U.S. program has been so successful, is that we, we feed the scientific needs of so many scientists around the world that it's not my interests or my team interests that are that are the most important, and so we have a we have a big base of users for the product we deliver, and uh, that keeps the interest in our product flowing very high. Now, I've seen some photos when you're looking for them. There are some photos where there's a snow field with lots and lots of rocks in it, and some places where you're just looking in a bed of rocks. Yeah. How do you tell the difference between a meteorite and a terrestrial rock? Well. Uh, if you want a nuts and bolts cookbook answer, the answer is look for this fusion crust. That's, that's really something that almost every meteorite is going to have as it plummets through uh, the Earth's atmosphere from space. Unfortunately, that can get broken and, and worn off over time. Some of these meteorites have sat on the Antarctic ice sheet for a million years or more, and that fusion crust can be gone. Um, and if, of course, the, the terrestrial rocks uh, that surround a meteorite in a moraine, for example, are also very black and shiny, well, then, then it falls down to just the uh, innate human ability to tell one interesting rock from well, another. A moraine is, is at the end of a glacier where it's been right. pushing rocks and dropping rocks at the these, end of the tip these, of the glacier, right? These glaciers, the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, are just scouring away at the continent of Antarctica. And, in fact... Uh, Glaciers are the most erosive force there is. They not only uh, sort of sweep away at the rock, they pick up pieces of it and grind with it. So since we're looking at places that are on the margins of the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, we do occasionally run into places where the meteorites have been mixed in with, with the rocks moved by the glacier. And in those cases, we've found actually that with a little bit of training, uh, with a little bit of building up of a catalog of the kind of rocks that are in a local area, uh, even the geekiest scientist can learn to tell the meteorites from the non-meteorites. There's hope for me. Yeah, there's hope for you and, and other geeks like you. That's good. Um, you mentioned earlier that you could, by looking at the meteorite, you could tell where it comes from. So there's different kinds of meteorites. What are the types of meteorites? Well, uh, some, some, of the, uh, some of the different types of meteorites are, the most common type are chondrites. And um, all the signs that uh, scientists have studied so far suggest they come from the asteroids. Um, they have, uh, in a gross sense, the same mineralogy as the asteroids and the same mineralogy as the solar system in general. Um, they uh, have uh, spectroscopic signatures that look very similar to the asteroids. And on the few occasions where we've been able to uh, photograph a falling ordinary chondrite, and triangulate back where it came from, it looks like it came right from the asteroid belt. Now, that's not direct proof. We haven't gone to an asteroid, picked up a sample, and said, gee, this looks just like ordinary chondrites. Mm -hmm. But we'll be there soon enough. Right now, that circumstantial evidence is most, most meteoriticists and most asteroid uh, studiers uh, think that link is pretty good. There are some, in fact, uh, more specialized types of meteorites, meteorites that show a history that includes volcanism, uh, and particularly a group called the Howardite Eucharite Diogenite clan, or HEDs Whoa. to its friends, uh, that spectroscopically match up with one asteroid in particular extremely well, and that's the asteroid Vesta. 
And uh, not only can we look at Vesta and see areas on it that match up perfectly with a bunch of meteorites that we have, we can also see astrophysical phenomena. The tug of gravity has uh, created sort of a cloud of little Vestoids around that asteroid and that they, might, they, they go into places where it's very easy for their orbits to migrate right to Earth. So in that case, it makes a very compelling story that these, this group of meteorites is derived from the asteroids, and specifically one asteroid. So it makes it easier for us to believe that, in general, the chondrites come from uh, the asteroid Are belt. they called chondrites because they have little glass beads inside of them? You've been working on this, I haven't know. I was waiting for that question. <laughs> <laughs> so chondrules are really a neat thing. These, these rocks, in fact, that are the most common of the meteorites are also the oldest material we've found and the clearest, uh, the clearest path towards understanding where it all came from. Uh, there are other meteorites uh, that come from more evolved bodies. We've talked about these rocks from Vesta, but we've even found a few specimens from the Moon and from Mars. Um, and there, particularly in the case of the Moon, we have gone and picked some of that up. So when the first meteorites from the moon were found, it was very clear what they were. The, the mineral makeup of them is very unlike any earth rocks that, that are in the, any way common, and yet uh, you know, the moon is made up almost entirely of just a few minerals. So we, we've, uh, we've established that link. The uh, Allen Hills meteorite, the Mars meteorite, has a little bit of uh, infamy attached to it. Can you uh, describe what happened? Well, sure. The uh, Allen Hills 8401 is its, its formal name. Uh, is, it has a really interesting history in that, first off, we didn't know it was a Martian meteorite when it was picked up. It was picked up by our program in 1984 from a place called the Allen Hills Far Western Ice Field. Um, and it was recognized as something unusual, but uh, it was misclassified originally as a, a rock kind of rock called the Diogenite. Uh, and that's one of those rocks we said might come from Vesta. For 10 years, people studied it and said, boy, this is a uh, weird diogenite. And uh, a fellow named uh, Dave Mittefeld, actually goes by the name of Duck, uh, was looking at it as a diogenite and realized it might be something else, did a few uh, geochemical tests and realized what he had was perhaps the most unusual Martian meteorite. And it is very rich in secondary minerals, which uh, in itself says that his, he has a history that involves not just a volcanic heritage, but also a heritage of interacting with climate. And there were a lot of researchers in the period sort of 1994, 95, 96, myself included, who really focused on this aspect of the rock. What was it interacting with? Was it interacting with water or CO2? What kind of temperatures were going on? How long did it take place? Was it one episode or a dozen? And we worked very hard on that. And most of the signs were pointing towards purely inorganic processes, particularly from my own point of view as a sort of a volcano guy. Um, so a lot of us were very, very surprised when the uh, NASA group uh, suggested in uh, a paper published in mid-1996 that they felt many of these secondary minerals either contained or were the result of the action of biology on Mars. Um, they, had, they had a whole bunch of uh, key points. I won't belabor them all, but what I will say is that uh, there were quite a few of us, obviously, who took up the challenge of testing all of these uh, rather extraordinary claims. And as of right now, they've basically been found wanting. There were some photos released with which, if you looked at them, had little squiggly worm-like, bacteria-like looking things inside the rock, and those were claimed to be microfossils, but that turns out to well, it's, not it, be true. You can find little squiggles pretty much everywhere you look in a rock that's uh, undergoing or an interaction with moisture. And, uh, you know, there were lots of other things. They found organics in the rock, um, and uh, the claim was that these organic chemicals must be a result of biological activity, but uh, we've also found since then that every single rock in Antarctica has organic chemicals on it. It's these rocks sitting in Antarctica and life is flying all over the place, so organics are pretty inescapable. 
Now, um, what you can learn from the Mars meteorites, not only do you learn something about the rocks of Mars, but they have a unique, uh, they have a unique place in science in that uh, Mars has an atmosphere, Mars has climate, Mars has weather, Mars has uh, seen interactions between water and gas and the rocks. And these kind of interactions can lead to the development of what a geologist would call a secondary mineral. Not the minerals that grew when a rock crystallized from a volcanic flow, but the minerals that grew when a volcanic flow reacted with rain or reacted with groundwater or reacted with the atmosphere. When you look at the Mars meteorites, and in particular the ones from Antarctica where they've been preserved very well, you can look at those clues and try to learn a little bit about Mars history. Other younger Martian meteorites that we found show less and less interaction with, with moisture in the atmosphere. It paints an interesting picture, frankly. If you read that history in the Martian meteorites, what you see is a place where interactions between the rocks and the climate have been seldom and rare for billions of years. And only if you look at rocks that are almost as old as the planet itself do you see any kind of significance. Uh, significant interactions. Even that, though, the interactions that we see in that rock, Allen Hills 84001, uh, are dwarfed by what you might see in a Hawaiian volcanic rock that's only a few hundred years old. So um, these Mars meteorites, in some sense, are not just samples of that planet, but they're kind of witness plates to Martian history. So and history that makes book. them incredibly valuable. And particularly when you consider that they cost a lot less than, than a typical Mars mission to get. Now, there's one more type of meteorite, and I've actually handled some of these. They're very, they, they seem very unusual because they're like metal. They're made of they're heavy magnet stick to them. Um, that's one that we haven't talked about yet. You've talked about the chondrites, and this is a totally different thing. What, where do they well, come from? Um, metal meteorites or iron meteorites, as they're kind of commonly called, are the ones you most commonly see in a lot of museums and science centers. Um, they are very durable. Uh, they're recognizable as something very different when a farmer hits one with a plow in his field. And as a result, they, they can be found quite easily in, in around the world. Um, the interesting fact behind that is, though, that they are not the most common thing to fall. Uh, chondrites outnumber them sort of uh, 80 or 90 to 1 in terms of how often they fall. Um, but chondrites are less durable, and the iron meteorites uh, last a long time. So we have this picture in our heads that they are what falls. They do represent something very interesting. They, they represent uh, parent bodies that have undergone a process called differentiation. That is, as the loose material of gas and dust of the solar system started to accumulate due to gravity to form larger and larger planetary bodies. Um, during this process, uh, a large enough body will have enough internal heat to allow it to sort of uh, sort itself out plastically. And more dense material, like metallic iron, will sink to the core, and lighter, fluffier material, like uh, crustal components, will float to the top. Iron meteorites clearly represent busted up planetoids, parent bodies for these meteorites, that underwent this process. They had differentiated. It's kind of a, a planetary scale evolutionary process, if you will. What we found uh, in these meteorites is that many, many small bodies in our solar system started to behave like planets, but that a uh, large number of them, 60 or 70 of them, came apart somewhere shortly thereafter. And uh, they're revealing parts of planets that you just can't see if you live on that planet. We have no hope of ever seeing the Earth's core. But we believe that it contains this same kind of nickel iron. Exactly. So the iron meteorites give us a chance to learn about things like core formation, to uh, you know have in our laboratory a piece of something that is buried 7,000 miles below our feet. It's really pretty neat. So why study meteorites? Well, um, if you're interested in the origins of things, uh, you can't go any further than the origins of the solar system. Well, I guess you can, but um, if the origin of the solar system is a great place to start and ordinary chondrites are pieces of that early solar system you can hold in your hands. If you're interested about the moon, 
uh, it's easy to argue that the meteorites that are being delivered are in some sense a better sample of the moon than the Apollo samples. Now, uh, the meteorites have had their context removed. We don't know exactly where they're from, but they are from kind of randomly distributed spots all around the moon, which the Apollo samples are not. And so in some sense, we're, and in fact, uh, many lunar researchers are now arguing that the, the Apollo samples represent a, a, a non-representative part of the front face of the moon, and that the meteorites are a better, are a better source of information regarding the moon as a whole. Well, thank you. Uh, this is Ron Hipsman for iStories.